This is a video in clinical medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. This video demonstrates the assessment of arterial perfusion of the lower limbs. Patients with peripheral arterial disease may present with intermittent claudication, muscle pain at rest, arterial ulceration, or gangrene. Trauma to the lower limbs can cause vascular injury through arterial dissection, laceration, or extrinsic vascular compression caused by a fractured or dislocated bone. Examination of the legs and feet may have to be delayed in patients with life-threatening damage to the airway, breathing difficulties, or cardiovascular problems. The aorta bifurcates at the fourth lumbar vertebra, L4, which in most patients is at the level of the umbilicus. At the point of bifurcation, the aorta forms the right and left common iliac arteries, which eventually form the external iliac arteries, each supplying an entire lower limb. The external iliac arteries travel beneath the inguinal ligament to form the common femoral arteries. Each common femoral artery divides to form the superficial femoral artery and the profunda femoris artery in the upper thigh. The superficial femoral artery travels through the anteromedial thigh and the subsartarial canal without branching and supplies the leg below the knee. At the level of the knee, the superficial femoral artery passes through the adductor hiatus and becomes the popliteal artery. Below the knee, the popliteal artery branches to the anterior tibial artery and the tibioperineal trunk. The anterior tibial artery then travels to reach the dorsum of the foot where it can be palpated as the dorsalis pedis pulse. The tibioperineal trunk further divides into the posterior tibial artery and the perineal artery. The posterior tibial artery travels posterior to the medial malleolus where it can be palpated as the posterior tibial pulse. A Doppler probe and a blood pressure cuff should be available. Introduce yourself to the patient and obtain consent for the examination. Ask the patient how he or she is feeling and if there is any pain or tenderness. Next, ask the patient to remove his or her clothes to expose the lower limbs completely. You should remove any bandages or wraps. Place the patient in the supine position, lying flat or with the head of the bed at a 45 degree angle as tolerated. If you are examining a hospitalized patient, observe the bedside environment for indicators of the patient's functional status or for evidence of risk factors for vascular disease. Look at the patient's hands for tobacco stains or cyanosis and assess the temperature. Check the patient's radial or carotid pulse to rule out atrial fibrillation. Obtain blood pressure measurements in both arms. Examine the abdomen for scars from previous abdominal surgery to the aorta and iliac vessels. Identify any sources of external bleeding. Always look at the color of the skin. Look for pallor or cyanosis, which may indicate ischemia, hypoperfusion, or severe vasospasm. In contrast, erythema may be caused by an underlying infection, such as cellulitis or an abscess. Also, identify areas of darker skin which may represent dry or wet gangrene. Look for thin skin or hair loss that may indicate chronic ischemia. Identify any leg ulcers, making sure to inspect the heels and the skin between the toes. Note the location, size, edges, and base of any ulcer that is present. Using an A to F descriptive system may be helpful in the assessment of an ulcer. Look for scars on the legs from previous procedures. Scars in the groin can be easily overlooked. Carefully examine the medial aspect of the leg for scars caused by lower limb bypass surgery, such as femoral popliteal or femoral distal bypass. The next step is to inspect the legs for swelling or wasting of the soft tissues. Swelling may be caused by infection, lymphedema, or deep vein thrombosis. A unilaterally swollen leg has an underlying vascular pathology unless proven otherwise. 
Leg amputations can be a marker of end-stage arterial disease or previous arterial trauma, as well as of poor functional status. Identify any toe, foot, or leg amputations and note especially whether an amputation is above or below the knee. Ask the patient whether there are any painful or tender areas in the groin, legs, or feet. Then feel the skin with the back of your hand to assess the temperature. Use your fingers and palm to palpate for tenderness. Gently palpate the thigh and calf muscles and then the foot, ankle, and knee joints. Inquire about pain, and as you palpate different areas, note the patient's facial expression to identify signs of discomfort. Palpate the tissues in the proximity of scars to identify any subcutaneous prosthetic grafts, such as bypass grafts. Use two hands to palpate the aorta above the umbilicus and slightly to the left of the midline. Palpate the common femoral pulse just below the groin crease at the level of the mid-inguinal point. The mid-inguinal point is the middle of a line running from the anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic symphysis. With the patient's knee slightly flexed and relaxed in your hands, palpate the popliteal pulse, which is not always readily palpable. It is easiest to feel the pulse with the index and middle fingers of both hands deep in the popliteal fossa while your thumbs rest on the tibial tuberosity. You can usually identify the dorsalis pedis pulse by asking the patient to lift the great toe upwards. This pulse will be found lateral to the extensor hallucis longus tendon, which becomes visible when the great toe is in dorsiflexion. Palpate the posterior tibial pulse behind the medial malleolus, halfway between the malleolus and the Achilles tendon. Record the strength of pulses on an anatomical or tabular diagram as shown. Assess capillary refill time by gently pressing on the pulp of the toe or the nail bed for three seconds and counting the time needed for reperfusion to occur. A refill time longer than three seconds is abnormal. Palpate the bones of the legs and feet, checking for tenderness, step deformities, and abnormal mobility. Deformities or fractures may compress and occlude arteries leading to ischemia. Assess sensation, movement, and signs of neural impingement. Note that ischemia and acute incipient sensory or motor loss are vascular emergencies requiring urgent intervention. Evaluate gross sensation by touching areas of the lower limb that correspond to specific dermatomes as demonstrated. Assess sensation in the legs and compare the findings from each leg. Assess the plantar flexion and dorsiflexion of the foot as well as the flexion and extension of the knee and hip. To identify sciatica as an alternative cause of lower limb pain, instruct the patient to perform a straight leg raise test. The leg elevation test, also known as Berger's test, is used to highlight poor blood flow in a critically ischemic limb. If leg elevation leads to pallor, place the leg in a dependent position and observe it for reactive erythema or dependent rubor while reperfusion occurs. Doppler ultrasonography can be used to assess the flow of blood in the common femoral popliteal, dorsalis pedis, and posterior tibial arteries and in any prosthetic or venous bypass graft. Healthy arteries produce a triphasic flow signal. As the severity of arterial pathology increases, the waveform becomes biphasic, then monophasic and eventually absent. The ankle brachial pressure index compares the blood pressure in the arm with the blood pressure in the leg. Please see the video on this topic at NEJM.org. Make sure that by focusing on the assessment of arterial blood flow, you do not overlook other life or limb-threatening conditions. In summary, when you perform a vascular arterial assessment of the legs, you must bear in mind the underlying arterial anatomy and its impact on perfusion of the skin, soft tissues, nerves, and bones.
If the patient has signs of peripheral arterial disease, obtain a consult with a vascular specialist. If there are signs or symptoms of critical ischemia, send the patient to an emergency department for additional assessment and further imaging of their arterial anatomy. Such additional imaging may include duplex ultrasonography, computed tomography, or magnetic resonance angiography.